Hello, and welcome back to the Nephrology Curriculum. Today, we're going to be talking about urinary tract infection, or UTI. Let's start out with a clinical case. The 29-year-old woman comes to the clinic complaining of a three-day history of burning with urination and increased in urinary frequency. She has suprapubic discomfort, but no new vaginal discharge. She's in a monogamous relationship with her husband, and she's been sexually active with her last sexual encounter three days ago. Her last menstrual period was about one week prior. On exam, she's afebrile. Her blood pressure is 118 over 72. Pulse is 70. Her exam is relatively remarka unremarkable, except for mild suprapubic tenderness to palpation, but no costal vertebral or CVA tenderness to palpation or percussion. The remainder of the exam is normal. Her labs demonstrate on urine analysis a specific gravity of 1.02. She's got trace blood and leukocyte esterase positive and nitrite positive as well. So the question is, what is the most likely cause of this woman's symptoms? Let's go through her case and see if we can find out. So I think what's important in looking at the history, she's complaining of dysuria, that's burning with urination, frequency and urgency, along with suprapubic discomfort, very suggestive of cystitis. She also had sexual intercourse, which has been associated with UTIs in women. And on exam, she's got mild suprapubic tenderness without having actual CVA tenderness, suggestive of an isolated cystitis. On urine analysis, we can see that having leukocyte esterase indicates the presence of white cells. And nitrites indicate the presence of a gram-negative organism, such as E. coli. So the question is, what is the most likely cause of this patient's symptoms? An uncomplicated urinary tract infection, or to be more specific, cystitis. So what would be most appropriate in terms of the next step in management of this particular patient? Given her symptoms and given her urine analysis, I think it's most appropriate to start empiric therapy. So we can use empiric antibiotic therapy with nitrofurantoin or trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. So before we move on, I think it's important to review some terminology and definitions. Let's start with cystitis. Cystitis is infection of the bladder or lower urinary tract. Pyelonephritis is infection of the kidney or the upper urinary tract. You'll also hear people talk about uncomplicated urinary tract infections. This is infection in the urinary tract where there's no functional or anatomical abnormality. There's no functional impairment or concomitant disease that would promote the UTI. A complicated UTI, on the other hand, is when infection is associated with a structural or functional abnormality in the genital urinary tract or the presence of an underlying disease that increases risk of acquiring an infection. You'll also hear the term asymptomatic bacteuria. That means that you have presence of two separate consecutive clean voided urine specimens where there's 10 to the fifth or more colony forming units per milliliter of the same bacteria in the absence of symptoms. Okay, so let's move on. When we think about who's vulnerable to UTIs, there's five different demographic populations that we really need to consider. First, urinary tract infection in children. Second, women in uncomplicated cystitis. Third is women with recurrent cystitis. And then fourth, complicated urinary tract infections. And then finally, asymptomatic bacteria. So when we think about the pathogenesis of UTI in an uncomplicated infection, uropathogens are present in the rectal flora. They can enter the bladder by the urethra. We do see an increase in frequency in women, and that's because of the smaller distance between the anus and the urethral meatus. There are also host determinants that are involved in promoting an uncomplicated infection. Behavioral. This includes sexual intercourse, recent antimicrobial use, or suboptimal voiding habits, so if people incompletely void. There are genetic determinants as well. The innate and adaptive immune response is going to be important, increased epithelial adherence of some of the bacteria, and a prior history of recurrent cystitis will also play a role. And finally, there are biological determinants the postmenopausal state, or glycosuria, particularly in diabetics. How about in a complicated infection? In terms of pathogenesis, the same risk factors and host determinants from uncomplicated UTI play a role here as well. But in addition, these patients will often have a structural or functional abnormality of the genitourinary tract. They can have obstruction or stasis of urine outflow. 
or they might have impaired host defense. This might be a patient who's immunosuppressed. There's also an association with diabetes mellitus. People with diabetes are going to be more prone to things like renal abscess, emphysematous pyelonephritis, and xanthogranulomatous pyelonephritis, which we'll be talking about later. So let's get back to our original clinical case that we were talking about. Remember our 29-year-old woman who came into the clinic complaining of cystitis. Her symptoms of dysuria, frequency, and urgency were very suggestive of cystitis. She had the right behavioral determinants. She had recently had intercourse with her husband. And on physical exam, she had signs of cystitis by having suprapubic tenderness. We knew without having CVA tenderness and fever that she likely did not have pyelonephritis or infection of her kidney. And her urine certainly looked as if there was infection with cystitis. She had leukocyte esterase that was positive as well as nitrites, which were indi indicative of gram-negative organisms. So our question is, what microbial agent would most likely be the cause of her cystitis? The answer is E. coli. What if the patient, though, instead was a 68-year-old gentleman who was hospitalized with a urinary catheter? Would E. coli still be the number one cause? We have to think about, in that population, nosocomial or hospital-acquired infections. Those particular patients may need coverage for organisms such as methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA. So let's review the bacterial etiologies of urinary tract infections. I want you to pay attention to these two tables that we have here. The table on the left are gram-negative organisms associated with UTIs. The table on the right are gram-positive organisms. And what I'd like you to note is that look at that first line. E. coli, by far and away, is the number one cause of urinary tract infections and uncomplicated urinary tract infections. It's to a lesser extent we see E. coli in complicated UTIs. But one thing that you should note, with complicated UTIs, we tend to see some of the more obscure organisms like Pseudomonas aeruginosa and some of the other Enterobacter species as well. For our gram-positive organisms, the most common that we see are going to be coagulase-negative staph, like Staph saprophyticus, in about 5 to 20 percent of uncomplicated UTIs, less so in our complicated UTIs. But we have an increase in enterococcal infections in complicated UTIs.